G'day, Dylan O'Donnell here from the Byron Bay Observatory. I have a confession to make. When I was a beginner, I bought the biggest telescope I could afford, the biggest Schmidt Cassegrain telescope I could afford, a 9.25 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Everybody, and I mean everybody, was like, that's too much telescope for a beginner. You need to start small, you need to buy a dob, you need to get individual, all that sort of stuff. Now I bought this telescope because I saw it on the International Space Station. A 9.25 with Hyperstar. And if it's good enough for Commander Chris Hadfield, God damn it, it's good enough for me. I'm not wrong, it's everybody else who's wrong. And once I figured out how to get this telescope to take pictures, once I'd spent the thousands of dollars to upgrade all my equipment so that I could use such a long focal length telescope to actually get some images, Things were great. I was getting images, I was getting features on social media. It was a good time, unless you were a pixel peeper. Now, a pixel peeper is someone who zooms into your image so they can look at your stars at a pixel level and go, you call those stars? <laughs> Disgusting. These stars look like shit. Do you even know what you're doing? And you know what? They were sort of right. There was one thing that I hadn't really solved for, the guiding. And it wasn't because of PhD or anything like that, it was really because I was using a traditional guide scope. This thing. Now I had this mounted atop my telescope and it looked cool. I thought it looked cool. It looked like a double-edged sword ready to slay the universe. And try as I might, even though I leveled this thing, you know, parallel with the telescope to within an arc second of its life and got the guide camera and the main camera agreeing on where it was pointing and all of that stuff, I still couldn't get round stars. They were still eggy and weird. And for a long time, I thought that this was the mount's fault. But the day I switched to off-axis guiding and got rid of the traditional guide scope was the day my stars became pinpoints. Like sorcery, it just worked. I was a believer. Now, there are some cases where you need a traditional guide scope, like with Rasa or Hyperstar, but for long focal length stuff, this was the solution. This changed the game for me. And I'm here to preach the gospel of off-axis guiding. I don't care if you're a beginner, intermediate, or working at the Vera Rubin telescope, you need to be off-axis guiding. Off-axis guiding is the way to go, and I want to, in this video, demystify what exactly it is, some of the things you need to know about, whether it is easy or hard. So sit back, enjoy the video, don't click on the ads to give me extra beer money. My name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star Stuff. <laughs> off-axis guider anyway. Let me explain. This bit goes to the telescope. This bit goes to the camera. And there's a prism in here which deflects a little bit of light off to this guide camera on the side. Most of the light comes through back into your camera. This doesn't actually deflect any light from the main image. Now I really like this particular one from Celestron because you can unscrew these and change the rotation while it's connected to your telescope. But you can also change the rotation of just your camera by unscrewing this side and then change the rotation of your camera and screw it back in. And that's really, really convenient, having the ability to change rotation on both sides of the off-axis guider. Uh, however, this introduces a lot of thickness. Look at this, this is about six, seven centimeters of thickness into my image train. But look at this guy. But that is tiny. Look at how thin that is. Now, my original thought was to change from the Celestron to this, but I really miss that rotation feature. The QHY off-axis guider has like plates and adapters, but no real option for rotation. So unless you've got rotation somewhere else in your image train, it's not gonna help, but it does leave a lot of space to introduce something like an automatic rotator or something like that. Also, the prism is really, really small compared to Celestron's prism. That doesn't make such a difference because the actual guide chip is gonna be small too, so it's gonna fit in there. Um, but these come in different sizes depending on your particular setup. The other thing to note is this helical focus up. To get the off-axis guide camera in focus, you'll need to shift this in and out until you achieve that focus. But one thing to note 
is that if you rotate this guide camera in any way, you will need to recalibrate your guiding. So to avoid that situation, a lot of off-axis guiders will have a helical focuser. A helical focuser will let you rotate this ring here to move the guide camera in and out without actually changing the rotation of the guide camera, which can really help so you don't have to recalibrate your guiding every time you refocus the off-axis guide camera. Off-axis guiding is great, it'll change your life. But you know what else will change your life? The fact that High Point Scientific are now shipping globally. That's right, all of you who've been whinging in my comments that High Point Scientific, the New Jersey astronomy store that has been sending to Americans all this time, now ships outside the land of the free. I don't know if they ship to Antarctica or North Korea or anything, there's probably a disclaimer there. And if you ship to Australia, it'll probably cost a million bucks. But that's the price of freedom, buddy. Check out www.highpointscientific. They sell all astronomy brands. They have a price match guarantee. Use the link here or the links in the description and I'll get a little commission so I can buy a double quarter pounder from Mickey D. So let's say you want to get started with off-axis guiding. What's the first step? Well, you need to get this into your image train. So I'll show you where you want to put the off-axis guider, but you want to put it before the filter wheel because that way you can change filters uh, without affecting the light coming into the guide camera. You want to be able to change to a hydrogen alpha filter but still the, the full spectrum broadband is coming into the guide camera here so that you don't have to change the guiding settings whatsoever. And those faint stars will still show up nice and bright. Now say this is your image circle. This is where the light's coming in from your telescope. You want that prism to be not obstructing the view. So when you attach your camera, you want the horizontal side of the camera chip to be on one edge. So it's going over that horizontal side. Because if you rotate the prism this way, the prism will hit the long end of your camera chip. And if you do that and the prism obstructs the camera chip like that, you will see a dark shadow in your image, either on the corner or on the side here. And that's something you don't want to have to deal with. So just make sure that your prism is rotated to the long end, the gap here. Now, when you first put on an off-axis guider, a lot of people struggle with finding anything at all. Um, it's hard to actually find a star and get it in focus. And the reason for this is that the main camera and the off-axis guider need to be both in focus at the same time. The distance of the light traveling through the light path here to the main camera needs to be exactly the same distance as the light path traveling through and then through this prism and then onto the camera chip of the guide camera. So try and rough it in first, then get the main camera in focus, and then run a long exposure on this to see how far out of focus you are on the guide camera. Then you can use a helical focuser if you've got one, or you can just slide the guide camera in and out until you find that focus. So main camera focus first, and then the off-axis guide camera. Focus that up, and as long as you can both see a focus star at the same time, you should be good to go. Something else you need to be aware of is that out of focus stars on the guide camera through a prism like this will look a bit wonky. They might look slanted, they might look skewed, and that's normal. Also, it's coming from the edge of the light path, not the middle, so you are gonna experience some comb around the stars there anyway, even if you're perfectly collimated. This is sometimes an issue if you are changing filters and the focus needs to change on the main camera because that's gonna change the focus on the guide camera as well. Uh, that's okay, guiding on out of focus stars is fine. PhD2 will find the middle of the centroid and will try and guide on that, even if the star is a little bit out of focus. You do have to be careful with off axis though, because those stars do look so wonky, if it turns into a line or if the star goes too flat or eggy, the centroid might jump around a bit and that will cause you grief. So just make sure you find a nice sweet spot for the focus so that you can change filters. But the good thing is that once this is all set up, once these focuses agree and the image train is right back focal distance, everything is good to go, you don't have to touch it from that point onwards. And then that's the goal, right? To automate as much as you can. So once it's set up, the rest of it becomes fairly push button. And if you're like me and you were using this rail for the traditional guide scope, it's now free for piggyback and for doing other stuff. Once off-axis guiding is set up, it is incredible because the apart from the difference in pixel scales of the cameras, 
the image scales are more or less exactly the same. You are guiding on the same light path coming out of the telescope. It's not a separate telescope. So the guiding agrees 100% with what the main camera is seeing. And that's why when I made the transition to off-axis guiding, I noticed uh, an immediate 50% bump in the quality of my guiding. I went from an error, a guiding error of one to two arc seconds to a half an arc second guide error. If you are having trouble finding guide stars, definitely bump up the exposure time in PhD2. If you don't have a very fast telescope, like mine's running at f7, which is fairly slow, then you might need to bump up that exposure to find faint guide stars. Also, definitely use a mono camera. This helps a lot. The sensitivity of a mono camera is four times greater at least. And if you still can't find stars, try bidding your guiding as well, and that will increase the sensitivity fourfold again. Mono is always the way to go. Once you go black and white, you never go back, right? That's it from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's been rainy as hell here, but I do have more projects coming up for you. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you've been watching Star Stuff. And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die.